In the name of the one holy and living God. So I'm guessing you were listening um, when I was speaking with the children about and teens about where where Pentecost comes from and what it is. And it's curious. We always talk about how we're Easter people, meaning we live in the resurrection and not stuck on Good Friday. But we rarely talk about being Pentecost people. And in some ways, that maybe that's understandable. Um, it's not quite as dramatic, and it's not the, it's not exactly the essential foundation of our faith as the resurrection is. Although it is, because it's almost like resurrection part two. And the story we hear from Acts, as I mentioned, I think last week, the book of Acts was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. They're separated in the Bible um, by the Gospel of John, a decision made a long time ago. But it's from Luke that we hear all about everything that happened from the time of the resurrection. In 40 days, Jesus was on the earth, and then the ascension, and then Pentecost. And it's really, it should be that we have three big holidays, holy days, Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. Now, um, I have to confess, I was a big Bed Bath & Beyond fan, and I, I, I mourned the loss of Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> but every year at Pentecost, I thought, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond should have had a big thing about, you know, you might get your comforter in church, but come to Bed Bath & Beyond and you can get a big down comforter, you know, because we call the Holy Spirit the comforter. I joke about the last in my last parish. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it's, you know, and maybe though it's kind of nice that it's not such a big public day because we're not distracted by, I don't know what the, the, the decorations and the cookies would look like for Pentecost, but it is a really important time. And as um, Faye said to one of the children, the idea of being the birthday of the church is because that's when really, you know, the, the, the disciples with Jesus, that's when the spirit comes and that's when they go out into the world. And I would say, you could say that's the moment when they become apostles being sent to, to, to preach the glory of God, to preach with truth, to preach with love, 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 always trumps it all. Love is always the most important. And that it was, you know, and, and the reason, um, and that was my doing eight years ago, the reason I changed the reading to listening to people like New Yorkers and Tanzanians, etc., was to make it make sense to us. Because the actual reading, um, you can check this you know, in your Bible, it's full of names of, of people from tribes and nations, most of which don't even exist anymore and don't really mean much to us. But think about in our world, if people from all those various places, and you could probably name more, if they could speak in a language we could all understand and be so open to do that. Because in order for the, the disciples to go out and do that, that required a certain amount of courage. They were doing something very different. And they were still a little bit afraid, but they went out. And in order for the people to hear things in their own language, they had to open their ears and they had to open their hearts. So there's this real openness and acceptance. And as I mentioned to the children, people from different tribes and nations don't just have language, like literal language, like what's the word for this or that, but it's your culture. And actually, um, we could, you know, we could go to neighborhoods in, 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 in Brooklyn or in probably in places in Westchester where people are speaking the same language, but they're speaking a different language. Has anybody here um, done connections? It's one of the new uh, New York Times puzzles. So what this does is they give you, so there's 16 words and you're supposed to make sense that of groups of four. And sometimes it's very, very, um, very, very, what's the word for four? Truce. And sometimes it's kind of obvious. So they might have something like, I don't know, pew, priest, communion, candles. And you say, oh, that's all things in a church. But one of the things that I enjoy so much doing this and find so challenging is a lot of them are words that, some of them are words I don't know at all, but often it's words that I know, I think I know, but it turns out there are new and slang definitions of these words. So even in my own language, I'm lost. And so my mind keeps opening. The other thing that happens, I don't know if you do, sometimes I go to look up a word and it comes up and it says, this is restricted to people over 18. So I don't go there. <laughs> but there's all these, you know, all of what is language. Um, and I think we began learning, well, I don't know when we began learning this, but we've come to know that people to speak the same language if you don't speak the same language, you really have to be open. 
and you have to be welcoming. And the word that is so loaded these days, but you have to be inclusive. And for decades, we've been talking about the church being radically inclusive as an expression of God's love. And I asked Cecilia if I had told this story last year at Pentecost, and she wasn't sure. And then I checked, and last year I wasn't here on Pentecost. So I may have told this eight years ago, but Cecilia told me it's okay to repeat a story because first of all, it changes as the context changes. And we do hear the same story over and over from the scriptures. So years ago in Salt Lake, I was a hospice chaplain. And that was amazing, amazing, sacred, wonderful work. And one of the couple people I was going to go visit and she's, before she died, gave me permission to tell her story far and wide so I can use her name, Jody and her partner, Jessica. And Jody had a, a terminal illness that had rendered her almost paralyzed. She could move one foot and it meant she could hardly, she couldn't speak, but she, could, she couldn't speak in a really intelligible way, not intelligent, but intelligible way, except her partner could understand what she said, but she made, she murmured basically and made some noises. So as I got to know her, what was amazing was I got, so I could understand her and I found it had to be very quiet and I was very, very focused and I began to be able to understand her. And then I was aided by a chart where you have the alphabet and you kind of go, but we would like Ben in his own. And as I learned her story, she was in her late thirties. Um, her story was <coughs> she'd been raised from, from the cradle um, in, a, in a Christian denomination and she loved church. She loved the gospel, she loved Jesus, she loved Sunday school, she loved doing things in the community. And she had um, spent a couple of years doing volunteer work for the church and evangelism. Um, but she came to realize whatever word you want to use that she was gay and was essentially given a choice to stay in the, to renounce her sexuality and stay in the church or to leave. So she left. Um, and that was a great, a great sorrow to her. And so as a hospice chaplain, it was not my job to preach any religion, including my own. It was my job to support people on their journey, whether it was religious or not, and actually to get people to get their rabbi in or their sensei or whoever. Um, but as in our conversation, she said, I want to join a church that believes in Jesus, that is, you know, really believes in Jesus, that has communion and baptism, that has communion especially, and that is welcoming, and that does work out in the community and in the world. So the obvious choice was the Episcopal Church. And I explained that to her and I said, but I'd be happy to bring in, you know, people from other churches. She said, no, let's do this. So she was, I can say she was Mormon. And the policy in the Episcopal Church in Utah was if someone who was Mormon joined the church, we accepted their baptism as we accept anyone's baptism. Many of us were baptized in one denomination and joined another. But sometimes people who were Mormon or LDS decided that they didn't feel their baptism was essentially valid, and so they wanted to be baptized in the Episcopal Church. So what we did was we had what's called provisional baptism. You may have seen one where we basically say, if you have not already been baptized, I baptize you. So that was our policy. Um, so she really wanted to be baptized, and we talked about doing it in her home with her partner and maybe a couple of close friends. Um, but she said, you know, I'd love to do it at church. Well, as it turned out, there was a baptism on Pentecost at the local Episcopal Church and my friend Lee, my late friend Lee was the pastor. And it was in the winter, it was in the summer, so she was able to go because she couldn't be in the cold. So Jody and Jessica came and Jody was in a kind of a, um, you know, a very what's the word, a complicated wheelchair because she couldn't move at all. So it was almost like a hospital bed that was, that was lifted to be a wheelchair. And, you know, during and on Pentecost, they were doing baptisms. So as you know, when we do our baptismal vows, there are questions asked of the people being baptized or of their infants, of their, their godparents. Um, and you have to say yes, but Jody couldn't talk. So the way Jody said yes was she would blink her eyes. So for all the questions that we asked, do you renounce Satan? Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? She would blink yes. And then she was baptized. And everybody was, was just, it was just amazing. And there were four or five other people being baptized. And later, several people came up to me and said, Gwyneth, did you see what happened? Again, it was Pentecost. 
and everybody could understand other languages. They said, did you see there was a new language here today? She blinked her eyes and we all knew what that meant. And then she later said to me, she said, you know, not just that I felt baptized, she said, but I felt completely 100% accepted here today. She goes, my wheelchair didn't matter. No one treated me like I was disabled. They offered to help, but no one treated me like I was disabled and no one seemed to care that my partner was a woman. So she experienced that. Several months later, and oh, I meant to say, the conversations we had, the first question she asked me was, could you please explain the doctrine of the Trinity? No. <laughs> I mean, we had these deep, deep conversations and she was just so interested in the church. And several months later, she wanted to be confirmed. And at that point, her illness was at the point where she couldn't leave. So the bishop came to her home and there were about I think, six of us there. And again, the bishop asking the questions that you ask people being confirmed, she would blame. So again, there was that language. So part of what, why I share this story is about what it means to accept someone who's different. And Jessica, Jody, Jody was different in two ways, her disability and her sexuality. And that all disappeared. And she was just there as a person who wanted to be baptized. And so in a way, in her wheelchair where she could not move and really couldn't speak, she was prophesying to all of us about what it could mean to a person. Several months, I had then moved back to New York and my friend Lee became her priest. And several months later, she did die. And um, happy ending because it all worked out. But unfortunately, she ran into a lot of problems because despite arrangements that had been made, documents that had been signed, the, the hospital and the funeral home didn't want to let Jody's partner have any, anything to say about what would happen because they weren't married, because they couldn't be married. And Lee intervened and everything finally worked out fine. And one of the things that Jody gave me before, she, before I moved, um, she always loved lighthouses. And she loved lighthouses because they symbolize the light that guides people. It symbolized a welcome to wayfarers and traveling strangers. And just, well, she also just loved the beach, but just loved the symbolism. And so she gave these different lighthouses to many, many people before she died. And it's become one of my most treasured possessions because it represents her faith, the church accepting her, and the lessons I learned from her and I think that she has become a beacon. So to be, to be Pentecost people means to really practice the radical inclusivity that Jesus practiced of love. And that God's love knows no bounds. And through us, God's love knows no bounds. So I always remember Jody and Jessica on Pentecost and what they showed me and what I hope I'm able to teach 